hello, everybody, and welcome to this discussion of Louder Than a Riot, NPR Music's new investigative podcast focused on the intersection of hip hop and mass incarceration. I'm Aisha Harris, co-host of Pop Culture Happy Hour, and with me now are Sydney Madden and Rodney Carmichael, the dynamic hosts of Louder Than a Riot. Welcome, y'all. Hey, hey what's up, up Aisha? <laughs> it's great to have you all here, and thank you to everyone who's ch- tuning in now. Uh, you should make sure you hop in the comments. Sydney and Rodney are in there, and they will be answering some of your questions as you check out this this video. So. I'm a huge fan of the podcast. I've been listening and binging just like a lot of our our viewers have been. And, you know, for those who are not familiar with the show or haven't had a chance to check it out yet, a little bit of background. Um, Over the course of 11 episodes, you two have been exploring the many ways in which law enforcement has collided with rap music. Stories like mixtape pioneer DJ dramas, legal entanglements with the recording industry over copyright, and Bobby Shmurda and his, um, how his gang affiliations landed him in prison just as the star was on the rise. So let's just start from the beginning. Can you talk a little bit about how this pod- podcast came to fruition? What were the conversations you all were having that sort of led to the formation of this show? Wow. Well, um, I mean, to start from the beginning, we got to go way back. You know, hip hop mm-hmm. has, has, has really paired this topic you know, uh, long before we, we thought of it as a, as a podcast idea, you know, hip hop and mass incarceration and, and really just black America, black and brown America and, uh, and mass incarceration or the over-policing of our communities has always been a topic in hip hop, right? You go all the way back to Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, the message, you know, which, you know, is actually one of the places that we start in episode one. Um, but for Sid and I, I think, you know, when we came to NPR in 2017, we both got there kind of bookended the year. We both got there at the beginning and end of the year. And we were definitely interested in starting up a, a you know, a, a new platform for hip hop at NPR, you know, <laughs> and um, we wanted it to be something that would be uh, dynamic, that would be about, that would center the music and the culture but that would also look at larger, you know, social political issues. And, um, you know, it, it felt like a very NPR type of thing to do. And I think this is a topic that's both been of interest to both of us for a long time. Um, it, it just, it, it came together and, and we kind of crystallized the idea. But Sid, you can jump in and, and yeah. finish my thoughts, yeah. Just to add on to that, the thing that is so, um, I guess pernicious about this topic is that it is sprawling and we know that and it, and it has so many tendrils and complications to it, but we ground each story and each theme in a real world um, case that made headlines however many years ago, whether it was 20 years ago or just last year. Uh, we show these that these laws and protocols and institutions uh, really do target and disproportionately affect Black America, and that the it's it's prevalent in the music as it is through Black life. And and Ronnie, he mentioned the message, and every ta- every song, whether it's at the top of the charts or it's just like an indie cipher, it has that essence to it. Like, I mean, I'm gonna quote the locks: "It's about money, power, and respect, right? It's about money that flows through the music industry and the prison industrial complex, whether it be private or public institutions. Um, it's about the power that hip hop holds to be um, a change maker and a trendsetter in pop culture at large. That is now a global phenomenon, and it's about the respect or or lack thereof of the people who create the art form, and and that lack of respect it it manifests in things that that black people in America don't always get the benefit from. And I'm, I'm talking about healthcare, education, infrastructure, on and on, you know? And, and every step of the way, in every era and every decade, hip hop has been, I think Rodney says it best, rapping and raging against this machine and against this institution. But what we do with every respective episode is we give you that proof of concept of like, this is how, this is the story and this is the theme that, that it speaks to in larger society. Yeah, I mean, 
I think that's one of the things that makes this show so um, special and intricate is the way in which even the minor players throughout the each episode have backstories that you delve into. Uh, you can't tell the story of Mac Phipps, the first three episodes of the show, without also telling the story of No Limit and exactly. Southern Hip Hop and putting that into context. Can you talk a little bit about what, like, what went into how you decided what you're going to choose? Because there are so many different threads to pull on. You know, was it was it a matter of sometimes of access? Was it a matter of just what you gravitated toward? Just in terms of how you shaped, how you've been shaping these episodes, what um, what were some of the criteria that you were looking for into like what would make a good story to and choose to go down that path to tell that story? I think it was a perfect storm of a few things you mentioned, whether it be access, whether it be um, a precedent being set in the culture or criminal justice. Um, and it really had to do with stories that not only featured high profile people, but also really lived at the crossroads of hip hop and mass incarceration. Um, you brought up the story of Mac Phipps and, and Master P and No Limit. And in our first episode, when we talk about the conspiracy against hip hop, when we talk about the, the conspiracy theory, I think we call it hip hop's Willie Lynch letter that marries the prison industrial complex with music, with record industries pumping money into it. Uh, you would think someone we would speak to is more of like a forefather of gangster rap, but then you see a different way in with Killer Mike and he contextualizes it and canonizes it through the, through the sense of Atlanta's lineage. Uh, same thing with Bobby Shmurda. Bobby Shmurda, I can tell you, living in New York during the time that Hot Boy took over the summer and took over the country, that that was a bellwether in, in a vile rise of an artist and their downfall within such a, such a tight period of time. And then it became something that was eulogized in the culture. Uh, same thing for other episodes we have coming up later this season. We're about halfway through our season now, but other episodes you're going to hear uh, a story about Nipsey Hussle. That's that's a story kind of behind the story of how he was killed in his own neighborhood of South Central LA in, in 20, what are we in right now? 2019. He was killed in 2019. Um, so I think it had a lot to do with time, access, stories that were representative of, our, of the crossroads of themes that we really wanted to hit and just moments in the culture that were bellwethers for change and that were wake-up calls for a lot of people, even if they didn't really realize it at the time. Yeah, um, you know, unfortunately, Aisha, you know, as, as, we, as we know, f fortunately and unfortunately, we had a lot of stories to choose from, you know, because this is just such a huge phenomenon. Um, and I think the stories that we selected we wanted to think about how uh, mass incarceration and the prison industrial complex is 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 first, um, you know, how it's manifesting in the lives of everyday, you know, black and brown folk, and what stories could help highlight that. You know, what stories could help highlight, you know, the the systemic racism that drives certain institutional forces, whether it be you know, probation and parole, which we look at in Nipsey's story, or whether it be about, um, you know, potential wrongful convictions, which is what Max's story uh, looks at, or, you know, in Bobby's case, where we actually look at, you know, violent crime and um, specifically plea deals and the power of the prosecutor so yeah, that, that was the kind of way that the, the way that we approached the season and, and thought about and selected uh, what yeah. cases we wanted to highlight. I was just gonna say, same thing with conspiracy laws. Through the reporting the Bobby Schmurda story and the story of GS9, we learned and discovered and uncovered that, I think Ronnie Curtin is around 94% of cases that go through the system result in a plea deal because of, <clears throat> because of tactics like adding adding felony charges on top of misdemeanors if you can if you can um yoke somebody up and, and and sweep somebody up in a conspiracy charge and what we really show in each one of these deep dives into 
into the laws, into the um, implementation of these laws, and into how these laws affect rappers and hip hop and hip hop culture is hip hop is a mic hip hop. What's happening in hip hop is what's happening in Black America. So. What's happening in hip hop here with this, the disparities in the way these laws are being used is a microcosm for what's happening in Black America and the disparities and how these laws are being used. Yeah, I mean, talking about the sort of the, the legal aspects and the laws, while listening to the podcast, I definitely felt like, oh, I wonder how much they had to research, you know, as people who cover music a lot. I mean, I'm sure we're, we're journalists, we have we have experience doing research and doing those sorts of things, but there's so much nitty gritty, especially with the Bobby Shmurda case, where you're talking to different lawyers about um, different aspects of the law. You know, how, how much of a deep dive, like, did you have to do in order to, to, to you know, get yourself familiar with it? And, and then how did you make that palatable and, and easily digestible for the audience to listen to? People who might not, who might be in the same position or might be even less uh, aware of the way in which the law works because the law as America is is just always me meant to be really difficult for the average person to understand and so trying to distill that for the for the podcast must have been quite the challenge for you or maybe not I don't want to assume but no, you know. <laughs> no it was it was <laughs> And shout yeah. out to our producers and our editors and our researchers and every intern we had uh, along the way, because it was a very, very steep learning curve uh, when it came to things about like the, the perils and pitfalls of parole or conspiracy law or marking the lineage of, of certain laws like non-unanimous non juries in states or lyrics on trial or, or prison protocols that that allow for such demoralizing, dehumanizing behavior to go down in behind behind bars. And I think what, in listening to this, I think what the the listener will take away is that this is not like a, like a true crime podcast you've ever heard before. This is not like a hip hop podcast you've ever heard before, because it's really bigger than both. It's about the socio-political entanglement and, and entrenching between the two that we're, that we're really trying to spell out and we're trying to make malleable and conversational. And we're trying to deliver in a way that somebody who is listening to hip hop radio would like digest it and think about it and dissect it and talk about it with their friends at happy hour or on the stoop or like sitting back from their desk at the end of the day or in a group chat, something like that. We, we always, um, we always strive to make all of the milieu as malleable and conversational as possible. And it's a lot of revisions, a lot of drafts, a lot of research, a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, I don't want to say dumbing down, but just making it more, making it more real to people, making it more feel real. Cause like I said at the top, this is, this can be such a strong topic and it can feel so overwhelming that you just want to opt out, that you just want to be like, nah, I get it. It's bad. I'm just going to look over here. But no, what we're doing with giving you these stories through the lens of a hip hop and pop culture take is that these, these larger systemic ills affect you too. Because if they affect the music you're into and if they affect the pop culture that you digest and that you and that help you find joy and live your life, that means it's affecting you too, even when you don't think about it. Yeah, and you know, another thing that we um we wanted to do in this in this podcast. So number one, we wanted it to be narrative. You know, we wanted to tell stories because that's the easiest way to communicate information. Hip hop is a storytelling genre. You know, um, everybody loves 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 a good story, and there's so many good stories um, in in hip hop. Um, but the other thing is, we wanted to bring in experts. You know, we wanted to talk to people who understand these intersections or the legal uh, issue or ramification behind a certain case better than we do. And so, we wanted to do the work, and and I'll say. Uh, you know, Sydney and I and our team, we tried to do the work of weaving together those two things, the narrative with, you know, experts like um, Andrea Dennis and Eric Nielsen, who were co-authors of Rap on Trial, 
you know, they've done the research, years worth of research in terms of, you know, how how huge of an issue this lyrics on trial thing is. You know, they they've done their best to 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 quantify the cases, even though, you know, as they say, it's 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 really almost impossible to to do that, uh, to pinpoint exactly how many cases they are, but they've they've counted hundreds, if not thousands of them. Um, and so, you know, we weave them into the story of of Mac. You know, they they already know about Mac's story. They write about Mac's story in, in their book. And so it made it really easy for us to say, you know, let's in telling Mac's story, let's take time to talk about this phenomenon of lyrics on trial. Let's use uh, Andrea Dennis and, and, and Eric Nielsen to help us explore this issue um, within this narrative structure, you know, and, and hopefully it feels like we're telling stories and not carting out an expert on the stage, but weaving them into the story, uh, you know, too. Yeah, I mean, that was another thing I wanted to ask you about because, you know, Rodney, you mentioned earlier how the, it, it felt like something NPR, this felt like a, the type of thing NPR would do. I think that's true, but I also don't think it's necessarily what people expect NPR to sound like, just audibly and sonically. Um, you know, you're very conversational, both of you. There are moments where you, you kind of interject your your own opinion for a brief moment or you editorialize a little bit. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, you know, the decisions behind doing that? Um, why, why you chose to do it in some circumstances? I think one notable moment uh, I remember is when, Roddy, you were interviewing Master P. Master P was kind of talking about how he came up from from the hood and you know realized quickly that he or realized that he had to like help at least try to get others out and and to do better for himself and that other rappers should want to do better and and get away from those things once you make a little money and Sydney you jump in and you're like that sounds a little bit like respectability politics so I I love those little moments and I'm curious as to like what the sort of conversation is like for you two when you're trying to decide when is the right moment to do that and when you kind of want to step back a little bit. Sydney, you got to take that one. Okay. <laughs> well, I know exactly the moment you're pinpointing and you can hear me be like, Rodney, that sounds like respectability politics because that was my natural reaction. And as a barometer, for the listener, and I'm thinking like the listener who would be someone within my and Rodney's, Rodney's age group who grew up and know how much of a venerable force Master P is in this culture and how much of, of an OG and respected um, um, person he is, it sounds really like, come on, man. So, so you got your gold key and you letting everybody else drown now, you know? So, uh, it, I always try to be like a barometer for the listener and for the culture and we're real people and we have we do have opinions about how how our subjects uh, how our subjects rationalize some of their thinking especially when they are they do have the benefit of being so removed from it that it's really just a story and a talking point for them at that point but uh, yeah Things like respectability politics, things like massage noir, things like uh, poverty porn, we call it out when it's there because that's what someone listening to the show would be. If you're listening to the show and you grew up as with, with, with hip hop being your soundtrack to your life, you're gonna think that naturally too. So I, why not just be upfront and say it? did you did you face any challenges in terms of allowing profanity because i know here at npr it's more or less frowned upon in general and just the media the mainstream media with the exception of a few publications try to shy away from using um profanity even in quotations and throughout this obviously there's a lot of songs that aren't bleeped out that are that are sampled here but then you also hear in conversation people cursing and everything and i'm just curious like how, were there any challenges to like letting those stay in or was there a back and forth conversation about that? It was never a challenge for me and Rodney personally because we want this to sound like 
the culture that it's coming from. And yes, hip hop does have profanity in it. And then the people that we're interviewing, a lot of them do live under these oppressive systems that we're trying to analyze and and bring to light. So yeah, well, sometimes when you're living under those systems, it does elicit a very visceral profanity-laced response. You can hear through our narration that Rodney and I don't curse, but we're gonna give people the mic and we're gonna let them sound how they naturally sound because that's the that's the intimacy and and the authenticity that we always strive to bring to the stories yeah and you know we're fortunate that this is a podcast right i mean we we, we obviously couldn't tell these kind of stories in the way that we're telling them on on on, on npr broadcast shows um but you know i think that was that was that was a intrinsic element for us it, it had to be a forum and a, and a format um or a medium rather that would allow us to make sure we didn't have to filter the culture you know we didn't want to we did we don't want to put a muzzle on the culture or you know um you know i mean we got the equivalent of, parent, of, of the parental advisory sticker we give you the warning before each episode you know that that uh the, the language and, and other things might be a little explicit but um you know black folk in america we've been living explicit lives since day one you know we we living under explicit conditions so you know let's let's not let's not mute you know if the conditions ain't muted let's not mute the the way we talk about those conditions you know and so it was important for us npr is is a medium where you really get to hear people you know and and hear different slices of america and so it was very important for us to make sure that the slice of America that we brought forth was was unadulterated and unapologetic too. Now, when it comes to someone like Bobby Shmurda, he's a very complicated case. Not that any of these stories are, are not complicated, but you chose for the second episode out of the three episodes focusing on him to take a step back and really talk about the one of the main reasons why he was pro, um, why, why he was arrested and why he's been in prison for several years now, which is his association with um, people who have killed other people or who have been accused of killing other people. And Brian Antoine was a young black man who was killed by one of Bobby Shmurda's uh, associates, and. It's, it's tough because there are so many people who see Bobby Shmurda as a hero and you, you dive into that and, and, and talk about that and how, you know, even though he didn't pull the trigger, you know, he still was um, blamed for this. But then you also have the story of people who are actually hurting. And first I would love to just play a short clip of you interviewing Mariah Sidney. Um, where she talks about what it means for her to to hear his song and to know that so many people are like excited for him to come home um and knowing that like he like her boyfriend will never come home so let's listen to that clip she listens to the radio and she likes hip-hop but her friends know to turn off hot boy if it comes on if i'm at a party i can't go to the dj booth and turn it up no I just have to sit there and suck it up. I home very responsible. And even though he didn't pull the gun, he wasn't there, he's glorifying it. He's making other, other people think that this is okay, that you can sit there and kill someone or do this and then turn around, put it in the song and blow up off of that. So yeah, it's not a party song for me. It's just a reminder of what they did. And those reminders are getting more frequent. Mariah is already seeing Facebook posts anticipating Bobby's release. Now he's gonna come out. I feel like if he would have at least even acknowledged it that like look I'm sorry that this happened maybe you know it could be like okay but at this point it's like y'all are just heartless (laughs) 
That's how I feel like they don't have like a human bone in their body. How many went down? All these people in jail. Brian's gone. And all you have to scream is GS9 and BMW or whatever you're repping. Like, it's not worth it. City, can you just talk a little bit about what it was like to to interview Mariah and also Brian's mother and how you approached it, considering that you, as a journalist, you know, we're always told you have to be objective, you have to go in without any bias, but, you know, when you're talking to someone who is mourning, mourning a loved one, you know, how, how did you approach the, that, those interviews and, and how did it inform the rest of your storytelling around Bobby Shmurda? That was a great question. Um, first, I will say that we're conditioned to think of guilt and innocence as binaries a lot of time in America, uh, especially living under a police state in a, in, a, in a state that prioritizes, you know, crime and punishment. You know, there, it's a very, it's a very clear cut line of who is innocent and who is guilty and who, and who gets afforded such, such titles and, and such grace in such terms. But I think it was important for us to take this divergence in the Bobby Shmurda story to show that these are real world implications behind the lyrics and that these lyrics and these moments, uh, whether it be a killing, a drive-by shooting or selling cracks since the fifth grade, they're, they're informed by trauma in a way that is invisible until it's not. Um, and on the point of objectivity, I think that this was a moment where if somebody would try to argue that we are not being objective as music journalists, because you know our, our beat first and foremost is the music, right? They, they could not argue that we weren't being objective, we weren't showing another side to the story, another truth within the situation. Um, but in a larger sense, I think there's been a lot of conversation and debate about what what objectivity means in the journalism space and there's a difference between being objective and being truthful uh, and I think that is something that in the Bobby Shmurda trilogy we try to challenge in the whole series we try to challenge uh, in the Bobby Shmurda trilogy specifically we talk about how Bobby and Brian grew up blocks away from each other. They could have had parallel trajectories. They even had similar dreams to, uh, to make it big. Bobby had music dreams, Brian had hoop dreams, right? Um, but the moment of impact and moments of tragedy that changed their lives, they, that's where their narratives is skewed. And to show the, show honor and respect for both of those trajectories and both of those narratives was a balancing act that took a long time to master. And I mean, it's still up to the people, up to the listener, up to our, our constituents if we did master it. But uh, I'm really proud of the work we did within that trilogy. Ronnie, do you have anything to, to add? Your thoughts? Yeah, well, first off, just that man, that episode is, um, is so heartbreaking, you know, and it um as 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 sad as it is, it's 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 so necessary and it, it really is in a lot of ways my favorite episode of the season. Um because it's so unexpected and because of the job that Sydney does interviewing um, you know, Brian's former girlfriend and his mother. And, you know, just the work that went into that, it was probably uh, I'd say, I don't know, maybe a year went into, um, you know, trying to get them to 
you know, be willing to talk. And, um, yeah. and, you know, then I think just Sydney's execution of the interview and the, the empathy that she shows and, you know, and, and the room that she gave them to, to speak their truth. It's, it's really, you know, what, what this series and what this, uh, what this podcast is, is about, you know, we want people to be able to, to speak their truth. And I think we had to challenge, it required us to challenge a lot of uh, journalistic norms that, you know, are not necessarily, um, have, haven't specifically haven't always treated us as black folk fairly. You know, journalistic norms like always taking the word of police or prosecutors um, as law without without challenging that or as fact without challenging that. Um, I think it's something, you know, that is so kind of ingrained in journalism. You know, you go to the authority figure and what the authority figure says you report as as truth without ever questioning that. And we had to question ourselves a lot of times to make sure that we weren't uh just you know blindly doing that um and 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 in some ways just becoming a, a microphone or a megaphone for 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 authority figures um you know but but making sure that you know the same skepticism that we're trained as journalists to 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 point toward you know whomever we're covering or whatever we're covering we need to make sure we're using that same lens when we cover these institutions of power. Um, and so I, I hope that that comes through in the series. I know it was definitely something that we spent a lot of time talking about internally in terms of, um, you know, reporting and telling these stories. And um, yeah, it's something that hip hop has always done. You know, hip hop is always, you know, as they say, spoke a truth to power, but but really, challenged and held up these these institutions as as you know and, and, and poke holes in them or, or you know talked about how in a lot of ways they were unfair uh to to us you know um so that was important that was an, an important thing i think for us to to kind of think about and, and highlight as we as we told these stories well i definitely think it came through for me i mean i've only heard half the the, the show so far, just like everyone else. But I, I really do think you do a really great job of finding that balance between, you know, um, your point of view, but then also bringing in all of these different voices and, and different perspectives and challenging those perspectives within the, the episodes. I think it, it really, really comes through. Now, a couple of final questions. Is there any specific case or um, sort of theme or idea that you kind of had your own thoughts about, your own opinions on that were radically changed in some way through the process of doing these episodes now that you're on the other side of it? I think it reinforced uh, a lot of my ideas that I might have second guessed as just me being a cynic, but it reinforced a lot of a lot of ideas I have about the criminal justice system with more concrete evidence. Um, so I wouldn't say I was I was surprised or anything was radically shifted in in a complete 180, but it was just more solidified, more certified, more verified of how uh, insidious some of the practices in this country really are. Yeah, I, I don't know if any if any of the stories we tell um, were surprising for me in, in that kind of way, uh, you know, but I think that Man, I, the Nipsey the Nipsey Hustle story I think is is one that you know we haven't gotten there in in, in the in the season yet, but um, I think that we we set out to tell 
uh, a story behind the story or, or a different side or angle of that story. And, and it's one that, you know, I don't think a lot of people have considered. And, and, and I think that story in a lot of ways might surprise people when they hear it, you know? Um, so yeah, <laughs> I don't want to ramble on, but yeah. And also it, it helped to, in learning the specificity of certain laws or certain lineages and countries and regions, um, and using music as a, as a tour guide to do so. I feel like it gave us more proverbial ammo to discuss these things and, and to relate to these things, especially in a, such an unprecedented time that we live in right now. Uh, and I hope that translates to the listener because like I said, the learning curve was very steep for this, for us. And I, I, aspire to make it less deep for the next person so that we can you know continue to talk about these things because even after these 11 episodes run the work is never done Rodney said earlier we could have talked about a lot of cases um there's cases going on right now that we are keeping our eye and our ear on and seeing how it relates to music seeing how it relates to this larger theme that we've carved out in the series and yeah the, the storytelling is not done for sure Well, that leads me to my follow-up question, which is, are there any possibilities of a season two happening? Putting you on the spot, sorry. <laughs> no, you're not putting us on the spot. You're putting our, you're, <laughs> right? you're putting our wait, bosses wait. on the spot. <laughs> right, right, right. You're putting no. NPR on the spot. <laughs> yeah. No, so we definitely have aspirations and ideas and things percolating to talk about in a in respective seasons. But yeah, it's not up to us, but to um to others. It's it's also up to the listeners. I mean, hey, True. if if if, if enough people if enough people listen to this podcast and, and share it with, with with a bunch of people and and not only that, but like talk about it. Mm -hmm. you know, talk about it. I mean, talk about these stories, you know, and, and, and don't, don't let this storytelling be in vain. Then, you know, hopefully we can keep on telling stories like this, you know, on this platform in particular. And tell it in a way that no one else can. Like I, I, I mean, not to brag, but I really don't think any other outlet network, what have you, would be able to do it this way. Like the high caliber journalism that NPR is known for mixed with the nuanced storytelling and music criticism that Rodney and I have like, you know, tried to tried to hone every step of the way and, and, and that the music team specifically has supported and incubated in the way I feel like we're the only ones who can do it. So, yeah. All right. Well, fingers no crossed. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> Um, I do want to get to one listener question because we did ask some listeners to submit questions ahead of time for you to answer. This one is from Philip Kaisman, and the question is, do you think there was damage done to rap in the late 90s and early aughts with the development of conscious rap as somehow separate from quote unquote gangster rap? As in, did it allow white authorities to give their blessings to some, like Common, who performed at the White House, without embracing the genre as a whole. And this person also notes that like record execs definitely marketed it in this way. Um, so yeah, that's the question. I mean, the, the interesting thing about it is I'm pretty sure anybody who was, who was branded with the label conscious rap during that era would wholeheartedly disagree with the fact that they in some way benefited from that label. <laughs> like. I mean, from 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 most deaf to I don't know whoever you want to pull out. You know, I think a lot of those guys have spent the last decade or so trying to shake that label because it's been so uh, limiting and restricting for them, not only in terms as artists, but but in terms of you know how they interact with the marketplace. You know, I think conscious rap rappers who got stuck with that conscious label. Unfortunately, it, you know, it 
it became a, some some kind of weird like albatross around their neck and in some kind of weird way where you know it was like they were expected to only rap about certain things or have a certain perspective and you know like anything that you attach a label to um it's going to have a duration in the marketplace before it's time to move on to the next thing it's not cool or hip anymore so I don't think I don't I don't think anybody would say they did them any favors by by, by sticking them with that label. That's that's interesting to, to think that you know you know like, like I said before it, it was it was the rap on the other end of the spectrum that was really getting the 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 juice from you know major labels and and the, and the push and that really I think aligned with the way that America you know stereotypes you know black folks historically in this country and and therefore was the easier kind of music to market you know the, the gangster image you know the outlaw image is is something that i think you know it, it became easy even if you weren't that gangster to kind of you know go to a major label and, and kind of get branded with that this this is how we're going to sell you to the rest of the country so yeah i think in any, if anything it might be the inverse of what what he suggested and you even said in the show, Rodney, like you planted that flag really early in our first episode. You said, let me just say this, all rap is political. So whether you're talking about trap or gangster rap or emo rap or drill or anything like that, there's always that ethos through all the subgenres. So to say that one particular um, section of rap or sector of rap is, is conscious, it kind of deems it like the other ones are not are like unconscious we're all anyone who has the the inspiration and the gumption to put pen to paper or put their put their words out on a mic in this way in this poetry is giving you a, a conscious assertion and and dissent of what society is deeming their worth uh and i always think back to even now some of the biggest rap superstars i'll say like like kendrick or cole like when Kendrick won the Pulitzer, everybody was like, oh my gosh, he's here, he's made it. He's on this upper echelon level. And we're like, we knew he was about this life when, when he dropped section 80, you know? Like even his, people were saying a radical divergence to Pimple Butterfly, we knew what it was. Obviously you weren't listening to the Kendrick Lamar EPs if you, did, if you were in there. You might be new here, but he's been about this life. Just like any, any one of the people who would wanna be, uh, who would, who would who've been deemed conscious rap now, like they're not, it's not new. It's not a new thing. Any, just because you deem it worthy at this point doesn't mean, doesn't mean they weren't always worthy to begin with. Yeah, and one thing I would actually challenge in, in terms of what, what, he's, what he's asking um, or the way his question was framed, if I'm hearing it right, is, um, you know, I would say the gangster rap is much more palatable to America than conscious rap. I mean, I think <laughs> I think if you look at the last 20, 25, 30 years of, of, of hip hop and, 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 you know, what major labels have gotten behind and, and pushed more. Prioritized, yeah. Exactly. Like, you know, the, 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 the outlaw, you know, as we say in, in, the, in one of the episodes, the outlaw has always, you know, has always been a, a popular figure in American culture, um, you know, and so... I think in a lot of ways, how hip hop was marketed began to change because of major labels understood outlaw better than revolutionary, right? Like it's, it's a lot easier, you know, it, it, it fits within the mold and the model of, of American culture um, to say, hey, let's, let's model this guy as, as a gangster or so than Let's 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 model and promote and market this guy as a revolutionary. He's who's trying to push back on 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 the very systems that that are trying to market and promote him, i.e., capitalism. Right? Like that that becomes a headier, you know, harder thing to to for I think for 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 market forces to to um, to grapple with. And so I would say that um, I don't think conscious rap was in any way developed or 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 uh, you know, furthered by, by market interest to, to show some kind of juxtaposition from gangster rap, if anything, you know, that, that era that was labeled conscious rap was, was, uh, was, you know, 
something that was in was directly challenging the narrative that was being put forth, uh, you know, and, and supported and promoted by by major labels. Yeah, I mean, it it, it just reminds me of the same the same issue that we saw with movies and and how black exploitation was something right. what what we mm -hmm. now call the black exploitation era was like a huge money boon and those are the types of movies that were being made instead of like sounder or you know yeah. those types of things and then later on we have boys in the hood which spawned menace to society and juice and like all these other sort of hood movies that some were good some were not so good and some were just straight up exploitation um so i would agree with that point but yeah so black suffering and black outlaw Ma the mainstream media loves that stuff yeah. uh, <laughs> and that's just that's what it's always been and and it's changed a little bit now but it's still very much that is the thing that we and by we i just mean america um loves to see more than anything it seems yeah. one of our experts in an upcoming episode um does a really good breakdown of this where he says you know blackness is synonymous with criminality and criminality is synonymous with entertainment so if so facto black people are entertaining and so and and the people living in the c-suite who are making the decisions about who gets that advance check and who gets to have that that album and that rollout and they're commodifying black pain and, and black criminality for their own financial gain so it's i mean it's it's very abc but when you think about it it, it really is it, get, it can be that simple well thank you sydney and rodney for being here and talking to all of us about the show i hope everyone tunes in tell your friends to listen keep listening it's been such a pleasure having you both here thank you oh thanks for having us aisha we appreciate it Thank you. And for everyone who's watching, listening, you can catch new episodes of Louder Than a Riot every Thursday, 12.01 a.m. Eastern in your podcast feed. Check it out. And thank you to everyone who watched this and was in the chat talking with Sydney and Rodney. Thank you. And we will see you all next time. <laughs>